Have you harnessed the power of books without words to teach language to your kids? In today's video, I'm explaining exactly how my family does that. Hi friend, I'm Sarah, and by now you might be wondering what kind of crazy woman I am for wanting to have books without words to teach my kids words, to teach my kids language. Well, let me explain to you. It's actually a really, really awesome way to teach your children language and to teach them narration. I am a mom of two little boys and we are a bilingual family, but these strategies do work for any family, regardless of how many languages you speak within your four, the four walls of your home. In this video, I first of all want to just explain why were those picture books are desirable and why they're such a good idea. And then two, to walk you through the process of how I use these books with my young kids. Third, to show you our favorite were those picture books thus far. I'm sure we're going to add more to our library. So let's get started. Why are wordless picture books desirable for teaching language? There are several reasons that I know of, and you might know of some more or might come across more reasons as you research into this topic. The first reason why wordless picture books are so powerful is because they actually draw production out of us. They ask us to produce words. I've noticed this in my sons. When they're looking at books, they cannot yet read, but the pictures in the books seem to just draw out of them storytelling. And so when we as a parent are looking at a wordless picture book, it's actually asking us to produce language rather than relying on the text. And I love text in books. I love, love, love that. And I think it's so powerful. So don't hear me saying that that's bad. That is a very good thing. But it's good to have a combination of reading other people's stories, retelling stories, and also just producing our own stories, becoming storytellers. This is something that I want to nurture in my sons. I want to nurture them as storytellers, and so I need to model this for them. As I'm modeling for them storytelling, and they can tell that I'm doing it because the story is changing a little bit every time that I'm retelling it in a book, and they learn the power of storytelling and also what storytelling is. Storytelling is not just reading the same words in the book every time that we read it. That is storytelling, but that's not the whole picture. Storytelling is about creating a story and wrapping your audience up in that story. If you ever sat at the knees of your grandparents or sat on their lap and just listened to them telling you a story, you know what that's like. You know that every time they tell the story, maybe they focus on a different detail in the story, or maybe there are a few different words that they use, but you know the general storyline. It's the same with these wordless picture books. They're nurturing storytelling abilities in us. Another word that we use for storytelling is narration. Narration is really powerful for nurturing storytellers. Uh, Charlotte Mason, uh, who developed her own educational philosophy, focused a lot on narration, and she might have had a little different take on it than I do with wordless picture books, but the idea is still the same, where children are retelling a story, it's building up their memory, it's also building up their observational skills. So that leads me to number two. We're not just building storytellers, we're not creating storytellers, nurturing them only, we're also building observational skills. As you're looking at where this picture books to tell the story, you actually have to look at the details of the pictures. There are books that are extremely detailed. There are other books that aren't as detailed and having a variety of these types of books gives us a lot of different observational skills. Looking at the details on the pictures, of course, helps us to become detail oriented. Looking at books that have less detail helps us to create detail. So it develops creativity. That's my third point, creativity. Nurturing creativity is something that is really, really beautiful with young children. As we're giving them the ability to tell their own story in the pages of a book, they are they're exercising their creative muscles, I guess you could say. They're looking at the details, but they're also imagining what is going on? What are the people or characters in the book saying? So it's a very powerful creative tool. Number four is art. Like I said, when you are storytelling from a book that does not have words, you have to pay really close attention to the pictures. One benefit of that is that you're learning a lot about art. You're learning about the colors that show the different moods and feelings of the characters. 
then you're also looking at the details. You're looking at how the different emotions are expressed in characters' faces and um, in their body language. And so this actually is a really great way to teach art. Number five, emotional intelligence. When you're looking at the details, you're noticing the body language, you're noticing the character's emotions, your emotional intelligence really gets nurtured. With little children, we have to teach them how to understand people's body language and facial expressions to understand their emotions. We're also giving them vocabulary for emotions and telling them this is frustrated versus this is shock, this is surprise, this is angry, this is tired. Um, lots of different emotions. Some of them look really similar, but when you're looking at the body language of the person, you can pick up on clues that teach you about the emotional state of that person. We're wanting to teach our kids how to recognize other people's emotions and also how to regulate their own emotions and to know how to handle those emotions in practical and very well-mannered ways. That's one reason why where this picture books are so powerful because they're drawing attention to the illustrations. Number six, consequences. When you're looking at the story and you're looking at the characters and their decisions and you're creating your own text to the story, your own storytelling arc over the pictures, you're noticing the consequences and you're actually deciding them in some ways. The illustrations do dictate a lot of the consequences, but as you're choosing the words of the characters, as you're choosing what they're thinking and possibly going beyond the pages of the story, if you're super creative, you um, get to see and recognize consequences of our actions. With young kids, this is really important because they're learning about the world. They're learning about their decisions, about manners, about regulating emotions, about their choices, about obedience, disobedience, all of these things. And they all have consequences. Our choices have consequences. And in a story that you're telling and that you're observing, you get to really recognize those consequences. Another benefit is problem solving. Problem solving comes into play in a lot of different activities that young kids do, but as they're telling a story, they have to solve problems. As they are creating the story, they might actually say something that later on in the book is contradicted. Maybe they think it's raining, but later on they realize it never was raining. So they have to solve this problem by going back, correcting themselves, and then moving forward with the story, or else trying to present evidence for why they think that interpretation is accurate. Another benefit is learning perspective. So as you are telling a story, you have to step inside of the character's shoes. And as your child is learning about perspective, learning about imagining things from another person's perspective, then stepping into these where this picture books from the main character's perspective is really a good exercise for them. They cannot just interpret the story stepping back and looking at the pictures. Sometime in their storytelling process, they will actually have to step into the character's shoes and then imagine what they're thinking and what they would say or what they would wish. So this may come after a while of storytelling and of course with age and the development of this skill of sympathy and empathy, but it's something that is really good to develop and actually relates a lot to emotional intelligence. Lastly, another benefit of Worthless Picture Books is learning about evidence. When you are wanting to present a case for something or wanting to present a case for your interpretation of a story, you need to provide evidence. This is something that kids will learn in literary analysis. As they get older, they have to show why they think an author is saying a particular thing in a story and they'll have to pull evidence from the text. It's the same with where this picture books. You're pulling from the illustrations the evidence for your storytelling. Hmm, why did the character say that? They look like they're smiling. Why did they say, I hate this? Hmm, do you think that really fits the story? As kids are telling the story, they actually have to deal with questions like these and present their case for why they think their interpretation of the illustrations is accurate. It's a great first introduction to literary, literary analysis and evidence. Hopefully, as I'm going through in these details of the benefits of Wordless Picture Books, you're also recognizing maybe some strategies and tools that I use with my kids as we're going through these books, but let me just spell them out for you. So here is my process for using Wordless Picture Books. First of all, 
I pick up the book, of course, and I observe. I ask my kids to tell me about the pictures or I start pulling out details of the pictures. We read the title, of course, and the author. And then as we're going through the book, the first time I will tell the story and I'll try to point to different details in the picture that show me the details of the story that I'm telling. Why do I think that what the things that I'm saying actually are grounded in the picture? As I go through, I will ask questions to my sons. What do you think will happen? Uh, we're using a lot of literary strategies like prediction and um, connection. Have you seen something like this before? These strategies you can use with any type of book, but I'm bringing them into our worthless picture book because I'm wanting my boys to observe. This first time through the book, I'm just telling the story, but I'm wanting to teach them that they too can observe the pictures and pull out the details. The second time that we go through this story, I'm wanting more interaction from my kids. And it might not actually be the second time, it might be the third time, the fourth time, however many times, until I feel like they um, have really stepped inside of the story and they can tell me the story or they just show me that they're comfortable. If my kids are really young and this is their first time working with storytelling, then I'm gonna maybe read more times to them. But as they get older and they're more familiar with this process, they can start actually telling me the story even the first time through the book. Um, and we'll just kind of switch on and off, me telling it, them telling it, whatever. Um, you can do these books as back and forth, where you narrate a page and your child narrates the next page. Um, kind of like um, those games you play at parties, maybe where you have to continue on with a story after a cliffhanger. Um, it's a great way to build teamwork and to build creativity within a, a framework where you've already been given some details you can't change where you're going to go from there. Then as time goes on, as we get more familiar with the story, with the book, I'll have my children narrate it to me or narrate it to themselves and I'll just kind of listen in in the background. I have heard my son going through books like this and actually telling himself the story without anyone listening. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing to see. Like I mentioned, one of the benefits of these books is their art. And so as we're going through, I'll try to point out some different things to my sons about the colors, about the mood of the story, and about the details and how the author drew the things. Sometimes I'll just ask them, what is this? And then they'll have to look closely and realize, oh, that's a chimney. And it might not actually look so quickly, like a chimney to them, they have to actually investigate a little bit, like, oh, there might be some smoke coming out. What kind of things have smoke on them? And we'll just continue asking questions. Questions really fuel these books. If you have a child who is struggling with storytelling, going through one of these books and asking them questions about the pictures is really, really helpful. It can build a lot of skills for them. Hopefully now you have a good understanding of the benefits of wordless picture books for developing language skills. And also of the strategy we use in our family for using these wordless picture books. Now I want to show you some of our favorite wordless picture books. Let me start with ones that are completely word free. Susie Lee creates beautiful books that are wordless. Wave and Fox in the Snow are some of our favorites. A recent favorite is The Midnight Fair. If your kids love animals, or they just love the circus, or they just love having fun, this book is awesome. It has so many details in it. You can retell the story from so many different angles, and that's a great, great, great thing to develop as your storytelling. Another recent favorite, Sidewalk Circus. This is awesome. My son loves it and he has just pulled it off the shelf a lot recently. Journey by Aaron Becker. I will warn you that this book has been called scary a few times by my oldest son, but I don't think it actually has really scary elements. It just is maybe too much for more sensitive children. Aaron Becker has other books that we really want to get our hands on too. I know at least one of them is called Quest and there's an entire series really highly recommend these ones. Time Flies by Eric Roman. And I believe this author has other books as well. Um, this book actually creates some problems to be solved in that the bird in the story is around dinosaurs in a museum and suddenly those dinosaurs are alive. So this is a great book for developing problem solving skills and also just creativity for explaining why something is happening. 
your kids are going to have to definitely provide evidence for their reasoning and for their story. This book we have in Portuguese, but I believe there are similar ones in English. If you're in Brazil, you can pick this book up, uh, Arvore do Brasil. This is The Tree of Brazil and it traces history. If you're looking to teach some history, try to get your hands on a wordless picture book and assess your children's understanding of the history that it covers. It's um, very good for assessment, but also just for helping your kids to recognize the time period, the, the patterns of the events um, relating to other stories that they've read, and also just the manners of, of life of the people. Two classic wordless picture books you've probably heard of are The Lion and the Mouse by Jerry Pinkney, a wonderful illustrator. This is based on the fable of The Lion and the Mouse, and this book does kind of break the rule a little bit, and then it has a few words, squeak, 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 on a few pages. Another book that is classic is Noah's Ark by Peter Spire. Again, this book has just a few words at the very beginning of the book and after that, no words. It has a lot of different details for kids to, to notice and to narrate. I'm going to give you a few books that bend the rules a little bit, but that we still use with this method. Alexandra Day. Your library probably has books by her, especially her Carl's birthday book is super popular. Kids love birthdays telling about the birthday party and about the sneakiness of this dog and the little girl is a favorite for my boys. Other favorites from Alexandra Day are Follow Carl, Carl Goes Shopping, Carl and a Sick Puppy, Carl and a Summer Vacation, Carl's Sleepy Afternoon, and Carl's Snowy Afternoon. Two more books that bend the rules a little bit are Goodnight Gorilla. Again, a few words, but most of the story is just pictures and it's a super fun story. Mine by Fed Federica Mua. This book has a few words again, but it's a great book for discussing sharing and greed. Those are our favorite wordless picture books. I hope this video has inspired you to use this method in with your kids, whether you homeschool, whether you do whatever you do with your family. Um, hopefully it's been helpful. If so, hit the like button. It really helps my channel to reach more people and other people can discover the joy of wordless picture books. And please don't leave without leaving a comment about your favorite book selections from this video or other wordless picture book suggestions. I would love to build our home library with more of these types of books. So please send me all of your recommendations. Thanks so much for joining me today. If you would like some more help with other book selections, then check out my other videos. I have a lot of videos about books and recommendations for different topics, especially for young kids. I will see you guys in the next video. Ciao.